Hello, I'm Ethan Minsker, and I grew up in Washington, D.C. Dyslexic, I found salvation in the punk rock scene. I started collecting records. Those records inspired me to make art, do fanzines, and write books. Music has always been the center of what inspires me. This is a travel show about finding new vinyl records. When I travel, I explore. My destination, mom and pop record shops. And my goal, to find undiscovered music. With the help of a few friends, follow me on my journey as we discover the creators between the grooves and find your next obsession. This is The Great Record Hunt. In the heart of every city still exists a local record store where you can find a clerk who knows the best unheard bands. New York City is one of the epicenters of music, and its reach and influence is worldwide. The local record stores have been an important part of that ecosystem. Not only is it a source to find music, they influence the culture itself. The stores provide a location where people can meet and talk about the music. Thus, communities are built around the love of records. One of those stores is right here in the West Village. We're here at Generation Records. For me personally, Generation Records has been supportive of what I do creatively. Whether it's a book or a fanzine, they've always made me feel welcome. And for the bands, they've been a place for in-store performances and record releases. They are willing to take a risk on you if you got the guts to put something out. When my father opened his record store, I was, I was not born yet. So by the time I was born, he had been open for eight years. So I started working in a record store illegally when I was a baby. Well, the first record I got, my mom got me a Coldplay album. And I was like, oh, you don't know me at all. But it was kind of cool, because she got me a record player. And I was like, thanks, mom. And then my taste just started getting really more in depth and obscure. And I was like, oh, I need. Japanese flexi discs, like from the 80s only. My friend that works at a record label, we dropped off records and he said that I needed steady work. And my friend Mark, the owner, just put me on immediately. I didn't even ask for a job here. I just got a job here. They were looking for help and I was, I was available three days a week and I, I just decided to help. It's a really small community. I mean, I'll see you at the Brooklyn Flea in the morning. Most of those people there, everyone's gonna know who I am. Generation Records opened in 1992 and specialized mostly in punk and hardcore, but they carried everything. We had a lot of, you know, famous people in foot traffic, things like Jimmy Page and David Bowie, and they're celebrating their 25th anniversary this year. So that's pretty cool. Why do I work in a record store? I mean, There's... pay is not like, it's phenomenally no, it's great. great. Health insurance isn't there, so no. you have to have like a great passion for it. I'm yeah, saying. absolutely. When I left, college and I was working with kids and I love teaching children things every day but now at a record store I learn something new every day so now I'm the kid and that's great it's almost like video stores where it's like a dying thing but records you know have been consistent that they've always seemed to stick around oh yeah the stores are still thriving and it outsold CDs last year records are back I think people realize that it's the best form of media because once they started reissuing all these things and making it brand new and packaged, you could sell a digital download with it. I just like owning stuff. So if I die, there's like, you know, it's not just like a little iPod. Something to give to my friends when I'm gone. Let me guess, you don't have a will though. No, no, so not a will. They yet. have to figure it out and fight over who gets the record. Uh, yeah. A lot of people come in looking for specific things, not realizing that condition has a lot to do with it. There's, there's a million different pressings of records. So when people go through dollar bins and say, well, this record looks terrible, and I, you know, I'm not going to pay for it. There's a reason there's a dollar on it, and there's a reason that titles on the wall are $100, because they're either original pressing or they're you know, some deluxe version. So you are getting what you pay for. I feel like a lot of people don't understand that. There's a lot of punishers in the record collecting community. Like, oh, if there's like a crease on an insert, they're like, oh my god, this is horrible. I'm like, just leave me alone. Be careful what you're buying and what you're shopping for. But I'm always in the mood for records. So you have like a record that's like your coffee record? Yes, yeah. I'm angry record. Mm -hmm. I had a breakup record. Uh-huh, everyone's got it. Every time something bad happens in my life, I like to listen to the replacements. Well, anyone who's sad, you should just obviously listen to Elliot Smith and never stop. 
This is Baby Shakes. This is uh, an all-girl band. This is one of my dad's favorite records of all time. They're also local, so this is New York. It's mostly predominantly rock, a little punk, but mostly rock. We sent my buddy Marcus to go check out the Brooklyn Flea Record Fair. Dozens of independent record labels are represented here. This is a major part of the ecosystem for these mom and pop businesses. It allows them to directly interact with their customers and develop a following. Each label has a unique sound and a personal touch. That's what makes these records works of art. For obscure bands, these labels are the laboratories that allows them to flourish. Sacred Bones was founded in 2007. We're celebrating our 10th anniversary this year. We opened up at the basement of Academy Records way back in the day. The label is run out of my apartment here in Brooklyn. It'll be five years old very soon. I'm still learning what I'm doing. I started at Astronautico as a radio show. I was in school in Montreal. And then when I got back to New York, I started a record label about seven years ago in, in Brooklyn. The label is called Mixpack. Despite my accent, we are Brooklyn-based. The label owner, Caleb, started it just as like a sort of a passion project, doing records for his friends. We've grown in the last 10 years to now having a huge roster. We do 20 or 30 records a year. And it's like really homegrown. It's just me and my girlfriend and a couple other people. But largely, we just make electronic music. We put out records by really like young, interesting artists from all around the world and Brooklyn as well. So literally, the label started by me being like, all right, I'm going to release my friend's music because these other labels are passing on it. And it did well, and it was really exciting. Yeah, how's New York influenced your label? I feel like we try not to let it influence us too much because there's a lot of trends that, you know, come and go. New York is obviously, like, on the cutting edge of a lot of trends and whether it's fashion, music, art, whatever. So we always actually tried to, like, block it out a little bit and try to just stay true to what we love deep down. I think that people see us as a Brooklyn label. I think they always have. To this day, we still always have a lot of New York bands on the label. The hustling aspect of New York, like, you know, I'm, I'm, I've been up every night just making t-shirts and just making things to sell and like, it's hard, like there's a lot of competition, but it's also like healthy competition. It's good, like I love these labels that are on the sides of me, you know, but like we're all trying to sell our stuff too. I mean, the truth is, like, making vinyl is difficult. You're not gonna, like, make a ton of money off it. It's really, like, a labor of love. Records take a long time to make now. I think in the 70s and 80s and even 90s, you could just pump them out in, like, a month or two, just, like, get it done. Now it's like you got a liaison between the artwork and the distributor and the artist, which takes forever. The pressing plants are really, there's like a log jam, all the major labels trying to get records made there. This one here I've worked on for over a year and it's finally gonna come out in about a week or two. We're down to put out any kind of music as long as it's interesting and, and inspiring. Pretty much every record has a story like that. Zola Jesus, she was discovered by my boss on MySpace like nine years ago. It's worth it and you're making a real physical object that's not just some streaming thing online. It's the art of the record cover that makes you want to listen to the music. And good artwork makes you want to pick up that album and find out more. Dima is a Brooklyn-based artist and graphic designer. You may recognize his work not only from record covers, but a lot of the best comedians out there. He's both an illustrator, painter, and musician. And I've been lucky enough to work with him collaboratively on projects. Hello. Hi. I remember like coming across a record, I would pick it up because of the artwork on the cover. The way I would hear about music is from like MTV, but I, I was always interested in album covers because I was always drawing. And uh, as soon as I started playing in a band, it kind of started clicking to me. It's like, oh, I should just be doing the album covers for whatever we record. Having the you know, artwork be as interesting as the music that it's not just like a throwaway thing. It's just, I like that it's like a package deal of like, so there's like a visual aspect to it. You know the band Fuzz? 
their first record. I remember I was in a record store and like I I genuinely bought it because I really like the album cover. I kind of can guess what this sounds like, but then like I went on iTunes just to kind of give it a listen. I'm like, this sounds exactly what this cover looks like. And that's probably the definition of what good record art is. Exactly. Is that the artwork yeah. is exactly what you're going to get. Yeah. Born in Russia, your family is from yeah. there. New York, has that filtered through your artwork and your music and influenced what you do? I've lived here my whole life, so clearly. <laughs> it's been kind of part of my evolution, even, you know, like my early bands were hardcore bands. This record, tell it's me like about this one. I got an email from Josh, I think it was all in caps, and he was very excited, and he was looking at my artwork for like the last like three hours. Here's an album I just did, listen to it, and if you like it, I want to ask you something. Uh, I was like, all right. You know, I listened to it, I'm like, holy shit, this is actually a great record. You know, it's rare that something like this good falls into your lap. When you did this cover, this kind of like set a lot of things in motion for you. A lot of people get tattoos from this album cover. But so like, now you have like a lot of the fans are reaching yeah. out and finding you because yeah. of this record. Yeah. That's the way it should work. The dream is you do your work and it really spreads out there mm -hmm. in, a, in a meaningful way. And that did happen with this. This is Christian. He opened Limited to One Records on East 10th Street in the East Village. Hi. Tell me about Limited to One Records. It's a very small boutique shop, highly curated, specialized in limited, out of press, not always contemporary, but a lot of contemporary music. Focused on indie rock, indie hip hop, a lot of punk rock, hardcore. And you also have deals with some of the record Labels sell just here, right? They'll go into their vault and they'll find stuff that's been out of print or test pressings or just generally hard to find stuff. What made you want to open up a record shop? That's kind of a risky proposition for a business. It is indeed. I've always wanted to be a part of the neighborhood in a different way than just living here. I wanted to contribute back to what makes this neighborhood so special. I wanted to do something where I could focus on something I love and I've been collecting records for a while now. Do you feel as somebody who collects records, owning a record shop means that sometimes you're taking some of the best items that you could sell and keep it for yourself? Yeah, I mean, you know, don't get high off your own supply. I have a want list of my own records, so occasionally I'll see something come in with a collection and I'll be like, oops, this one's coming home with me. But, you know, I have to be a smart business person, so a lot of times I'll begrudgingly put something up in the store that I want to keep for myself. What made you fall in love with vinyl records? I ended up buying a lot of 45s, and that was sort of the beginning of my collection. I liked having records, but I didn't want to lug like, you know, 1,000, 12 inches from, from apartment to apartment. I was a really big Misfits fan when I was a kid, and I like dreamed of owning all the original Misfits 45s. It isn't until I moved into the East Village that I started getting into 12 inches of full-length records. What I find is that this shop is, it's a real sweet spot for a lot of people. It's exactly what a lot of people listen to and there hasn't been a shop around that focuses just on this stuff. Since the resurgence of records, people are coming into the shop and all these like younger kids who are suddenly into records again, you know, and they're going back and they're doing what I did when I was younger. That's been really exciting to see in the shop. This is Ted. I've known him since we were 16 years old. He used to play in a lot of local bands and put out his own vinyl records. As an adult, he makes artwork. A lot of it's centered around vinyl records. Let's meet Ted. Most of my work, as you know, is about music. Music communities, musical instruments, and sound. When I was 16, a family member was hospitalized for a year, and it was incredibly traumatic, but I joined a band. The band saved my life, literally by going to shows and playing gigs and writing music and playing music, I was redeemed. So a lot of my artwork's about the redemptive power of music. And then as I've grown older, it's also a tool that I use to sort of investigate transcendental themes, 
or existential themes. Pretty much all of my work has its roots in, in this seminal year, 1986. As negative and dark as it was, it also was sort of romantic and enchanting. I know you did one project where you made the armor, right? Which yeah. It was from the year 1986. Yeah. Can you give us the rundown on that? So in 2009, I did a, a piece called Saint Antipode, which was a suit of armor made out of all the records I listened to in 1986, all B-sides. I sort of have this philosophy that you're either an A-side person or a B-side person. People who understand vinyl will understand this, uh, this metaphor. A-side people take whatever the cor corporation tells you is the hit. B-side people are the people that are hunting through the uh, record racks to find the, the hidden gem, the remix. In my own way, I judge people. <laughs> You're either an A-side person or a B-side person. All right, what am I? You're a B-side person. All right, you know, B-side. <laughs> and then I took the Billboard Top 200 chart, which includes actually a pretty wide range of music. It has Metallica and Madonna and Whitney Houston and uh, John Cougar Mellencamp. I turned all of those records into skulls. All the A-sides, so, so like this. So the vinyl skulls started when I read this nonfiction essay by this transcendental poet, uh, Rainer Maria Rilke. He has this essay called Primal Sound, and he talks about when he was a kid, they made a very primitive Edison cylinder where they were able to record, record sound waves onto a wax surface on a cylinder. And then later when he studied anatomy in Paris, he saw the coronal suture, which is where your brain plates meet. And he marveled that that looked like a sound wave. And then he asked this question, what would that sound like? So I wanted to make a literal representation of this idea. And I take a record and I just melt it over um, a plaster skull like this. Some people out there might wonder what a vinyl junkie is. My interpretation is it's somebody who collects a lot of records. Maybe too many records. Maybe so many records that it hurts their wallet. Maybe so many records that they don't have any room to live. And that they have they to have live, to live in, in a garage because their house is full of records. I'm a vinyl junkie. I think it's a good habit to have. Do you have any thoughts of why you keep coming back to vinyl records? My biggest project to date is this thing called Nova Records, where I travel around the world. And so I go to a city. My last one was in Amman, Jordan. And I found these re really cool guys that gave me a space. And we opened up a record shop and invited anyone to come in and to cut a vinyl record for free. People come in and they get three hours to, to cut a song under 10 minutes. And they walk out with a copy of their music on vinyl. And I get to keep a copy. It's a conceptual art piece, which is more about communities, the fellowship of shared performance, getting people together around cutting vinyl. But it's not even really a, about music at all. It's about an exchange of information, the transcendental quality of vinyl. I know it, it makes it sound ridiculous when I say it's not really about music. No, I mean, yeah. music is about community for most people, I think. Yeah, yeah. And I think the reason Never Records has been so successful is that there's something missing in our culture, and that is the support of communities that give someone an uplift, you know? And yeah, the, the record is a symbol of a lot of things. It's a symbol of my youth, but it's also a symbol of the alchemy of, of the world. I think it's a gorgeous object. There's no records without the bands. And for this band, rock and roll is at its core. Let's meet Baby Shakes. Yeah! So you guys have your music on vinyl records. The first record we ever put out was on Dishmast Records. It was a 45 single, and then about a year later, we released another single on Sandwich Records. Then after that, we released an LP with DMR again, and since then, we've released two of our own LPs. What's the benefit of putting out your own records? It's a whole lot of stress. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of work. It's kind of cool to see all four of us, like we 
were there from the very beginning of like writing all the songs and then to the very end of figuring out like who's gonna manufacture like the, the records and then sending it like individual orders. I think every band ends up being a small business to itself. Yeah, definitely. You know what I mean? Like if yeah. you wanna succeed, you actually have to bring in an income to be able to continue doing what you're doing. I think the vinyl records makes it sort of a tangible way for you to bring in an income. I mean, it's probably more than if you just did downloaded music, right? Well, definitely. I mean, usually we go through someone else and then, you know, we get a percentage of the records and we wind up selling them. But this way, we control how many records we press, how many we want to press, and it's on our own time. Yeah, it is rewarding, but it is very tough. But it's a full-time job. It's another full-time yeah, job. Definitely. It's not <laughs> yeah. going to be more. Job. I think but it's more rewarding. Time. It's the rewarding full-time job. Oh, for sure, for sure. Definitely. Well, it's the one that we like. It serves the creative soul. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When you're doing your records, do you do anything kind of special for it? We were talking about color vinyl and those type of things before. In the early days, we did color vinyl. I think when we started putting out our own records, we just made it all black vinyl. I feel like the quality is a little bit better, too. Better. It lasts yeah. longer. I've heard that, too. Is that true? Yeah. It is. When I was a kid, I used to buy these, like, picture discs. And I remember, like, kind of one of my first things was, like, this Billy Idol record. Oh, awesome. And I was like, I don't even really listen to it anymore. I ever did. But, you know, did, would you guys ever do a picture disc? I don't know about picture discs. Yeah, this was pretty cool. We did a heart shape. Oh, nice. Look at that. <laughs> that one this was a very limited pressing that Rob's House. From Atlanta. From Atlanta did for us. That was for our first South by Southwest tour. So when you're making the records, do you guys have any stories about like the production of records? You want to do the Sorry Eyes? Sorry Eyes. Sorry, sorry Eyes. We chose one of like the most expensive record pressing plants. We had, a, th I think, a thousand copies yeah, yeah. sent thousand. to us. And so a couple of them were like scratchy, like the sound was going in and out. It was almost like a layer of film on it. About a third of them were damaged. So that meant that you had to check all of them. I got to imagine that if you listen to those, every one of those songs over and over again at the end, you're like, I don't want to even play these anymore. <laughs> yeah, like, right before. Then you're going to go play it live. Like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> I remember when I used to buy records through the mail, you would get little extra stuff from all the bands. What kind of stuff do you add in there? Stickers, little cards, yeah. pins. Yeah. Judy hand presses like all the pins. A lot of music and you know art forms are coming out digitally. What is the reason you would want to actually put it into a physical form? Well, we all grew up listening to vinyl. Yeah. Yeah. All of our collection, we are, we're all record collectors, we yes. collect vinyl. Yes. Vinyl is timeless. It's proven to be like the most everlasting form of music if you take care of your records. I know it's cheesy or whatnot, but like you could just feel more of the emotion of like the music. It's just, it's just a different experience. It's the grooves that you find the best cuts. And I look at the bands and the record shops as the track that makes up the album of New York. Everyone works hard to build this vibrant scene. It's like a family, and even if they don't know each other, I find common traits in their personalities. The clerks, musicians, shop and label owners are all down to earth, driven and supportive of each other. It must be the music that threads them together. That love, it's pressed into every vinyl. Making things happen in the city can be tough, and those who can survive can thrive. 
This city is always changing for better or for worse, but there'll always be creators and makers at its heart.